Erev Tov. Hello, everyone. Welcome to the beginning of our Israeli writer series this semester. We already had a, another series last year, um, which uh, we, where we bring Israeli writers on campus. Uh, no longer only on Zoom, and I'm glad uh, you all made it as well in person. Uh, I also welcome people watching us virtually. Okay, you have to like, uh, kiss the mic. Um, I am very happy to welcome, uh, first of all, Lillian Abenson and her family. Um, Lillian, of course, gave the name and much more to our chair in Israel Studies, and I'm always very happy to see you here, Lillian. And is this better? Okay. Uh, I'm also glad to see a lot of students, um, which is also not always a given. Maybe it has to do with the fact that we have a speaker who is a bit younger than the average of speakers we bring in. Actually, it shows me how old I am when I think about the fact that my dear colleague, Pulitzer Prize winner, Saul Friedlander, is the grandfather of our author uh, tonight. Um, so, he will be introduced by my dear colleague, Lauren Strauss. Before I introduce Lauren briefly, I also want to say thank you to Laura Cutler, who again made this possible. Thank you, Laura. And thank you, Lauren, um, for organizing the series again. Um, Lauren Strauss, for those of you who don't know her, is a professor, a senior professorial lecturer in the history department. Her area of expertise is American Jewish history, but uh, she also teaches courses on literature, American Jews, and Israel, and many other topics. Um, she has degrees from Brandeis, Yale, and the Jewish Theological Seminary. And this specific series is also part of her class on Jewish literature she's teaching this semester. With this very brief introduction, Lauren, you will uh, introduce our writer tonight. So welcome, Lauren Strauss. Thanks, Michael. This feels very Hamish. Um, it's a nice, nice size of crowd. And I, I think it's very appropriate, actually, for the speaker we have, the author we have tonight. Um, Michael and Laura and I had the great pleasure of having dinner, uh, too brief a dinner, um, with with Omar Friedlander. And uh, and I think I think you'll see that um, there's a level sorry there's a level of comfort there in um, his persona, and also. Interestingly, I, th I think with his characters, um, a, a way in, a way to get to know his characters and to know him through them, although that may be deceptive, and I'll ask you about that, and maybe a way to get to know a little bit more about modern Israel um, and its uh, ever-complicated situation and to know about the world, because really the mark of a great fiction writer, and, and really, I'm sure you're sick of hearing about how young you are, Omar, but but, uh, but really, at such a young age, I mean, I, I think you're a great writer. And uh, so I'm really thrilled that you could join us. I'm thrilled that my students are here. Um, of course, they were threatened, so uh, <laughs> that they would have come anyway. So, uh, so Omar Friedlander uh, is the author of the short story collection, the award-winning short story collection, The Man Who Sold Air in the Holy Land. Um, and, uh, and he's won a number of awards for, for that book um, from the Association of Jewish Libraries. Uh, the, um, uh, he's shortlisted for the Wingate Prize in England, which is very, uh, very prestigious. And he's also won a number of awards, also is, as an individual, um, as, as a writer, not only for that book. He um, fellowships, really in the form of fellowships. He's had fellowships at uh, Breadloaf, which is the, the writer's um, uh, sort of cooperative. And also, um, uh, he is a student, um, he was a student at NYU in, uh, in creative writing. 
He is originally, he's from Israel, originally born in Jerusalem, but grew up in Tel Aviv. And, um, <clears throat> and he, as you'll hear, his English is perfect. And he spent time in his childhood in Princeton, New Jersey. And he has also uh, spent time in uh, England and in America before. He earned a BA, in fact. Um, from Cambridge University in, or the University of Cambridge in English literature, and he earned an MFA from Boston University. Um, so, uh, so where he also won many awards. I was absolutely bowled over when I went to Omer's website and I looked at some of the accolades there, and they just go on for pages. And uh, and and it's it's really remarkable to see, um, first of all, the the reception of uh, somebody with a first book, and also really interestingly the um, the distribution, the spread of um, of the first book that I learned at dinner was published last April. Um, so uh, so really, any of you aspiring writers out there, that's uh, that's a lot to aspire to. Um, so we're going to hear first from Omer. He's going to read us some selections, and then he and I will have a conversation, and then I very much hope uh, to hear questions from the audience. I know that he has a few fans in the audience who have already read the book, and uh, but I will mention, as you may have noticed, that we have copies of the book for sale outside, and Omer has graciously agreed to sign those books um, afterwards, and we'll have a brief dessert reception. So thank you so much for being here. So it'll be, I guess, um, a mix of a, a talk and a, and a reading, um, because I know, you know, when it's just a reading, it can get a little boring, uh, or the readings I went to sometimes. Um, but I actually wanted to start um, by reading a poem I, I didn't write, uh, by Yudha Michai, which I assume most of you know. Um, it's called The Eyes, and uh, I quote it in the first story. Uh, in the collection, Jaffa Oranges. Uh, so I'll read it first in English, uh, and then in the Hebrew original. Uh, it's very short, um, and then I'll talk about it a little bit. Eyes. My eldest son's eyes are like black figs, for he was born at the end of summer. And my youngest son's eyes are clear, like orange slices, for he was born in their season. And the eyes of my little daughter are round, like the first grapes. And all are sweet in my worry. And the eyes of the Lord roam the earth. And my eyes are always looking round my house. God's in the eye business, in the fruit business. I'm in the worry business. Uh, so in Hebrew, in I'm. עיני בני הגדול כתהנים שחורות שנולד בסוף הקיץ ועיני בני הקטן צלולות כפלחי תפוזים שנולד בעונתם ועיני ביתי הקטנה עגולות כענבים הראשונים וכולם מתוקים בדאגתי ועיני אדוני משוטטות בכל הארץ ועיניי שלי מחפשות תמיד ליד ביתי אדוני בעסקי עיניים ובעסקי פירות um, so Amichai is maybe Israel's most celebrated poet, uh, even um, you know twenty something years after his death, um, and he's both an insider and an outsider. In some ways, he disavowed uh, poetry and Israeliness, and in other ways, he embodied them both. He was too loud. He was generous to his readers, um, insisting that all of his poetry books 
published by Shokin, be printed in the same format of 10 by 18 centimeters so that they could fit in a reader's pocket. Amichai once said that the writer should never take anything for granted, not formulations or words or reality. This is one of the reasons why, as a writer, he was perhaps fascinated with the way children think. Everything to them is surprising, new, a constant revelation. A writer then needs to be in a constant state of childlike discovery. Like all children, I loved stories, but stories for me had an added mysterious quality. My father is a collector of children's books. I remember going to flea markets and used bookstores with him uh, to look for these beautiful illustrated books. In my father's study at home in Tel Aviv, they're stacked on shelves and piled on the floor and towering on tabletops. I loved looking at the hand-colored engravings in the 19th century books and even handling the physical objects. And I think it's partly why I wanted to become a writer. I loved some of the classic books that most Israeli children know by heart. One about a hedgehog named Shmulik who gets strawberries stuck in his quill. You know, <laughs> and another called Room for Rent by Lea Goldberg about a group of animals living in a shared apartment building. Uh, there were also fables by Aesop about mice and golden bells, the jackal with the tail of wheat, and the goose with the golden egg. But my favorite story was one about the legendary golem of Prague. I would stay up late at night looking at lithographs of the eerie haunting figure of the golem. Hugo Steiner, who's the illustrator, uh, Hugo Steiner's golem was pale, with a very large, hairless head, dark cavities for eyes, and surprisingly thin, delicate lips. It always gave me nightmares. There are many variations on the story of the golem, but the one I heard most often went something like this. The Maharal, the most famous rabbi of Prague, went to the banks of the river and built a man out of clay. He engraved the Hebrew word emet, truth, on its forehead, and the golem sprang to life. It served at the bidding of the rabbi, protecting the Jewish community from threats. But one day, on Shabbat, it disobeyed the rabbi and went on a rampage, destroying the ghetto with its cramped tinker shops and hunchbacked homes. The rabbi had no choice but to destroy his own creation. He erased the first letter, Aleph, from its forehead, leaving only Met, meaning dead. And the golem was deactivated and turned lifeless. One of the many things I find exciting about this story is this possibility of metamorphosis. The golem transforms from an inanimate lump of clay into a living puppet, a kind of automaton through the power of words. There's a kind of instability in these fairy tales, a blurring of borders, and I was never too worried about blending fable and myth with realism in my own work. Since my favorite story is borrowed from both traditions, rather than adhering to one narrow path of storytelling. In the world of fairy tales, the boundaries between adulthood and childhood are not so distinct. Adults can become childlike in their fantasy, and naive children are often faced with the violence and darkness of the adult world. I don't think fairy tales are about escapism. There's a seriousness to them. And there's a certain vitality and vividness to becoming childlike again, which is especially important for a writer. The job as a writer, in a way, is to daydream. It's a vocation that is both childish and very serious. A serious form of play, or a playful kind of seriousness. Um, so when I was six years old, uh, my family moved to Princeton, New Jersey, that you heard in the introduction, uh, for two years. And I couldn't speak English. Uh, so I didn't understand why I needed to stand up uh, when everyone was reciting the Pledge of Allegiance. So I was often punished. Um, but punishment at this school uh, was kind of fun because they would send me to this small table in the corner of the classroom next to an aquarium filled with hermit crabs. And these hermit crabs um, were my favorite part of going to school. So I found ways of getting into trouble so I could see the hermit crabs. And I remember staring at a teacher without blinking and breaking a pencil. And I was sent to the hermit crabs. 
Yeah. yeah. Um, but thinking back about it now, there's something about the hermit crabs that maybe appealed to me, something about their rootlessness, the way wherever they go, there's their home. Like snails and turtles, uh, you know, they carry their homes on their backs. Uh, I moved around a lot growing up. This probably more than anything made me the kind of writer I am. I never felt at home in one place, and I was stranded in a kind of um, no man's land between English and Hebrew. My decision to write in English, if it's a decision that's conscious or not, um, had to do with me feeling like both an insider and an outsider in Israel. Although my stories all take place in Israel, in the Middle East, uh, writing in English allowed me a certain kind of distance uh, that was necessary, maybe, in order to be more probing and playful and ironic, and to see all the strangeness and particularity of the place with its many contradictions and complexities. Writing about Israel, a place as surreal as Israel, is a bit of a balancing act. Sometimes true stories can feel like fantasy. In Israel, um, as you may know, any forgotten backpack is a potential bomb. Um, and as a kid, I grew up during the Second Intifada, so this was more uh, present. Um, but I, I was kind of, I guess like now, a little bit spacey. Um, I've been known to kind of daydream a little. So I forgot my, my school bag on a bench one day in the bus station. And it was, you know, reported as being suspicious because I, I left it there. Um, and they sent a little robot to blow it up. And I remember when I finally remembered my, my backpack. I had gone to a friend's house or something. Uh, and where I left it, and I returned, and it was gone. So I told the teacher the next day that I lost my homework because my school bag was blown up. Um, you know, the Israeli version of the dog ate my homework. <laughs> um, in Tel Aviv, I lived only five minutes away from Spinoza Street, um, which is a kind of small street with old ficus trees and uh, some pale Bauhaus buildings. And it's also the street where Kafka's literary estate was kept hidden uh, for years in an apartment filled with cats. Uh, whether or not the spirit of Kafka hovers over my neighborhood growing up, his work had a big influence on my writing. In particular, his profound mixing of humor and tragedy. And there's a very small piece by Kafka, it's only a paragraph long, uh, which made a big impression on me. And it's called The Little Fable. So I'll read it out loud now. Alas, said the mouse, the whole world is growing smaller every day. At the beginning, it was so big that I was afraid. It kept running and running, and I was glad when I saw walls far away to the right and left. But these long walls have narrowed so quickly that I am in the last chamber already, and there in the corner stands the trap that I must run into. You only need to change your direction, said the cat, and ate it up. Um, so what I like about this fable, which is sort of unusual, is that there's no moral at the end. It ends with the phrase, you only need to change your direction, which the cat says. And you think it might be a kind of lesson, but it gets the mouse eaten. Um, and I have one more connection to Kafka uh, through his native Prague. So um, my grandfather, Saul Friedlander, um, as you mentioned, uh, he was born in Prague in 1932 uh, at the worst possible moment, as he writes in his memoir, four months before Hitler came to power. And on the night of a terrible snowstorm in 1939, the Germans marched into Prague. Um, my grandfather spent the war years in France, where he was living in hiding in a Catholic monastery. His parents attempted to cross the border into Switzerland, were caught by the the gendarmes and deported to Auschwitz. Years, up, years later, after the war ended and my grandfather was preparing for the priesthood, he learned the fate of his parents. My grandfather became more conscious of his Jewish identity and immigrated to Israel. And I remember uh, on the year of um, my bar mitzvah and also my twin brother, uh, same, same day obviously, um, <laughs> um, we got an assignment at school to draw a family tree and interview our family members. So we were planning to interview our grandfather. 
about his experiences uh, during the war. And our dad bought us a kind of tape recorder. This was, I guess, pre, pre iPhone. Um, you know, for the occasion, he said, don't forget to press record. We were talking to him. Um, so we were actually in Paris, uh, visiting family at the time. And I remember entering this kind of a restaurant, this brasserie, and I had this brand new tape recorder in my hands. And my grandfather sat in front of me. He's got this silver hair, which is pretty nice. Um, there's these tall windows uh, facing a rain slick street and elegant waiters whisking around silver trays with you know, lobster shells and steaks and oysters um, and chocolate cakes with mountains of ice cream and cherries. Um, and we were more used to kind of hummus and falafel. We've never seen anything so decadent before. And our grandfather waved to a waiter and he ordered french fries for us. And we ate the fries. Um, and he started talking. He said, you know, I was born in Prague at the worst possible moment. Um, and he talked and he told us his life story and we forgot to press record. So many of the stories in my collection are preoccupied in some ways with the memory of the Shoah. And uh, as third generation, uh, I felt I needed to approach, to approach it at an angle um, rather than head on. And I had an idea for a story after a conversation with some Israeli friends, uh, jazz musicians uh, in Brooklyn. Uh, and one of my friends whose family um, is from Iraq, uh, he was always jealous of his classmates who had relatives that were Holocaust survivors. And this is a kind of strange, unexpected emotion, uh, the social cachet of trauma. It stuck with me and eventually it became a story called The Sephardi Survivor about two brothers who are so jealous of their Ashkenazi classmates, who have relatives that are Holocaust survivors, that they decide to kidnap an old man and pretend he's their grandfather and bring him to class for a school show and tell the Holocaust memorial. <laughs> yeah. um, I'll read a little bit from that story uh, so you can get a sense of it. When the competitions were held at school, the grandfathers and grandmothers were paraded around like slow moving trophy dogs. They were carried around from event to event, pulled out at the last minute, and used as excuses for not completing homework on time. I'm sorry I couldn't study, because I was listening to my grandfather's Holocaust story it was a common reason for failing a math test. Our sworn enemy was Matan Moldechai Mendelbaum, who always had the best Holocaust story. His grandfather was not only a survivor, he was also a respected historian, a world specialist in the field whose books on the Shoah had won awards and prizes. The Mendelbaum home was filled with shelves of his books, translated into dozens of different languages, all with swastikas on the cover. I imagined all the Mendelbaums sitting together at the breakfast table, picking at crusts of baguette and expensive smoked salmon, quoting their favorite parts of Schindler's List to each other. <laughs> I was so jealous I wanted to wring Matan Moldechai Mendelbaum's neck. Thankfully, the Elvis of the Holocaust, as Mendelbaum frequently referred to his grandfather, didn't live in Israel. My brother and I would have surely lost if you were coming to class to tell his story. When Zol, which is the brother, when Zol and I brought Yuda in, and Yuda is the old man, shuffling forward nonchalantly down the corridor, the other kids called him the Sephardi survivor behind his back. We looked like a strange trio walking together to class. Yuda with his eyes the color of gray porridge, his pale wrinkled skin and tufts of white hair sticking out on the sides like Ben Gurion. A strange looking grandfather like clownfish among sea urchins with our dark poppy seed colored eyes, our curly black hair and our angular faces. We didn't look anything like him. The school was filled with survivors all wearing their best clothes for the big day, their hair slicked back on a bright scalp or covered with a flat cap. They brought Tupperware boxes of foul-smelling soups, swimming with knedelach. Our nemesis, Matan Moldechai Mendelbaum, was wearing his bar mitzvah shirt, lugging a suitcase filled with his grandfather's books and looking smug. He stared at us walking past, one eyebrow raised. 
when we passed him, a noticeable chill crept over me, and I shivered, as if he had brought an Eastern European gale of freezing wind with him to the hallways of Janusz Kolczak Middle School. You're late, boys. I knock our teacher, stood in front of us, blocking our path, hands on her hips. But we have a survivor this year, Joel said. I can see that, she said, looking Yuda up and down. So, how are you related to the boys? He's our grandfather, I said too quickly. I'm their friend, Yuda said. What he means, Joel said, is that we're so close, it's like he's also our friend. But he's actually our grandpa, you know, by blood. Listen, boys, there's nothing to be ashamed of if you don't have any relatives that are Shoah survivors. Not all of us can be as lucky as Mendelbaum. <laughs> it was time to share stories. Each survivor came up to the front of the class. Some of the miniature ones preferred to sit in a small chair fit for a child, while others stood up to their full and impressive height or leaned against the chalkboard. Sitting next to me, Yuda was looking nervous, even paler and more Ashkenazi than usual. <laughs> Zal was massaging his shoulders, preparing the lightest featherweight boxer in the world for his big fight. Float like a butterfly, sting like a bee, Zal whispered when Yuda's turn came. He stood in front of the class, introduced himself as Yuda Finkelkrab, born in Warsaw in 1931, the son of a seamstress. Then he put his hands in his pockets and took them out again, scratched the back of his almost bald head, tucked at his collar. He was sweating now, rubbing his hands along his pants, leaving marks. He hummed a tune, drumming his fingers. So are you a survivor or not? Matan Moldechai Mendelbaum said. He was sitting at the very front row, hands neatly folded in his lap, with his grandfather's books, there were so many of them, piled on the table in front of him. What's your story? Yudha nodded vigorously. Yes, yes I am. My story, well, let me tell you my story. He stopped speaking and gazed off at a speck on the wall. But no one was paying any attention. Everyone was talking and laughing. In the back of the room, one of the survivors was showing off a magic trick he had learned in the ghetto, producing a five shekel coin out of thin air and making it disappear again to thunderous applause. Anat gave me a look as if I had personally failed her and shook her head, disappointed. I couldn't believe Yuda was blowing it like this. This year we were finally going to have the best Holocaust story, but he was ruining it. Yuda looked at me, pleading. I couldn't save it. No one could. Great. Um, so there are certain subjects uh, like the Shoah, I think, that can cause the imagination to freeze and petrify if addressed head on in fiction. And sometimes I think the only way to write precisely about it is actually by writing indirectly. So uh, Italo Calvino, the uh, Italian author, in his lecture on, on lightness, gives this example from Greek mythology. To cut off the Medusa's head without being turned to stone, Perseus must be indirect in his gaze. He can only look at the Medusa through the reflection in his shield. Approach a subject directly, and he can petrify. Instead, try to be the hero of lightness and reflection, clouds and wind. This idea of lightness and reflection is also, in my mind, connected to a kind of stubborn optimism. And it's a time which is difficult to be optimistic, and I don't need to list the reasons why. Um, in some, in some ways, it's easier to grow cynical, and it's, this is especially true in Israel. Uh, in a situation which is so full of violence, the conflict feels sometimes like an endless cycle of bloodshed and retaliation and revenge. Um, but I believe in what David Grossman, uh, the Israeli author and peace activist, uh, calls acquired naivete. It's a kind of conscious and determined decision to be optimistic in a desperate situation, such as the conflict, a refusal to give in to numbing despair. So I was born in 1994, a year before Yitzhak Rabin was assassinated, and with him, many of the hopes for peace with the Palestinians. I grew up during a violent and cynical time, the Second Intifada, the Second Lebanon War, four wars in Gaza now, and most days, 
it feels very difficult to fight this feeling of hopelessness. But in my story collection, I wanted um, not only to focus on the politics, but to focus on the more intimate stories of my characters and to try and struggle against this kind of fossilized, overly simplified narrative so common to the depiction of Israel and Palestine uh, in the news and not through fiction. Um, in my acknowledgments, I quote an interview by David Bosman, and he says this. Every one of us has a kind of official story that we present to others, to strangers we meet, or even to people we know. But if we are lucky enough to find a good listener, sympathetic witness, then they will make us tell not only our official story, but the story underneath it. The power of a good story is that it does not protect us, but instead exposes us, brings us into closer contact with our own life. And this is what I hope to do uh, with my stories, to unearth the stories of individuals and to be a sympathetic listener to my characters. Uh, I think I'll end there and can move to the Q&A section. Uh, Omar, that was uh, that was beautiful, and I'm glad that you saved that for the audience, and that we didn't hear all of that at dinner because um, you know it's it's fresh in my mind. You seem very in control of not only each individual story, but of your overall um, message and what you want to convey with your craft. Not only focusing on an individual plot but the idea of writing and what a writer can do in the world. Um, so I'll, I'll leave the political questions for a little bit later, but one thing that, um, that occurred to me while I was reading is that writers are often told, write what you know, right? Have, have you been told that? Yeah, yeah. Okay, write what you know. So you're a 26, 27 year old, 28. 28. Right, you were born in 94, I was thinking in 96. So you're 28 year old, excuse me, I'm so you're old. Uh, so you're 28 and you're Ashkenazi and you're male and all of these things. And who are you writing about? Not just about, but you're inhabiting the minds of an elderly Holocaust survivor, a bereaved mother, a Bedouin teenager who's a boy, a young girl who's like just gone through puberty, and I could go on and on. And you know, in Israel, somebody might say to you, Ezo chutzpah. you know, what, what nerve do you have? You're not writing, or are you writing what you know? So when you sit down and you start to write a story, how do you get into that mindset where you're representing really beautifully all these different people who are not you? Yeah, it's a good question. Um, I think, uh, firstly, and maybe it's related also to my uh, reading tastes, but the kind of stories that, are, that feel like the author is writing about themselves and uh, nothing happens, uh, aren't those stories that I enjoy um, reading usually or, or writing. Um, so I feel like it's in a way related to this question of language, of writing in English rather than Hebrew. Um, it gives a little distance. And I guess the question of experience also gives a little bit of distance. Um, I find it very hard to write about myself directly, um, my experiences, and um, even you know writing this kind of talk was surprisingly hard. Um, so I, I find it easier to, to have some kind of distance and um, whether it is through a character that's different or a different historical um, time period. And I guess um, people getting mad, yeah, I mean, I think it helped that I was, when I was writing it, I didn't really um, think that many people would read it. It was uh, before NYU and, and all that. It was kind of, I was writing mostly on my own. Um, and maybe that helped take off some of the pressure, um, thinking that I'm just writing this for myself for now. 
Have you gotten any backlash uh, in, in today's society, and certainly in America, there's a lot of conversation about representation and that a person you know, shouldn't presume to play the role, especially in a movie or a TV show, of somebody who is another race or another gender, uh, et cetera. So do you feel that, that it's different maybe with fiction, or has anyone reacted negatively to that? I feel that it is different with fiction, um, maybe because there is something that uh, maybe what's inherently part of fiction or, or some kinds of fiction at least that's being written is being able to put yourself in someone else's shoes and imagine a different experience. Um, and, you know, whether or not it creates empathy or, <laughs> or not, it's something that people sometimes throw around. Um, this idea of reading that creates empathy or fiction that creates empathy um, because you're imagining the experience of someone else, it could be true, but I think on a more kind of fundamental level, uh, for me it makes for more interesting storytelling. Um, so I don't think this is, it's true for all, necessarily true for all you know, artistic uh, mediums, but for fiction, I do think um, I do think it's true, yeah. That it's okay. You mention, among others, um, Yoda Amichai and David Grossman and Italo Calvino. Um, are these your, uh, your models? Do you have people who you look to as your, as sort of your inspiration for your writing? Um, I think it depends on the project. There's, I feel like you're, you're kind of, uh, when I'm reading sometimes it's, uh, for kind of fuel for, for a project, if it's a novel or a, um, for the stories, um, it was a mix. I mean, I think one of my favorite writers, you know, was uh, Jhumpa Lahiri, and uh, on the surface there's not much similarity uh, between the stories, but sometimes I read for language or for, um, for different reasons. So I think uh, I'm not necessarily writing from the Israeli tradition, but maybe, in a way, it's closer to the tradition of writers uh, writing in a second language, um, which, which, feels, which feels a little different, because the Israeli literary scene, you know, almost everyone is writing in Hebrew, and there's some exceptions we talked about, Ayelet Sabali and all that. Um, but it feels a little, a little different to be writing in English. So I'm not quite sure where I fit. It's astounding, those of you who have not yet read Omer's stories, that he wrote these in English, um, not in his native language. It is really, it's humbling. I remember in high school learning that Joseph Conrad uh, who wrote Heart of Darkness, uh, of course his native language was Polish, and, um, and it really is, you know, there's this list, but it's a fairly short list of writers who can do that. Um, and uh, at what point did you decide, or, or was it a decision? Was it more of a natural thing that you, you know, that you started your writing career in a language that was not your, your native tongue? I'm, I'm not sure it was a decision. Um, it felt, it, it felt sort of natural. I guess I was reading a lot in English. Um, and I think, um, like I kind of mentioned in the talk, it did give me a kind of distance uh, from the material. I think if I was writing in Hebrew, um, maybe, my, my kind of feeling is that maybe I would have gotten lazy at some points because I feel like I, I know the place. Uh, so with certain descriptions of, um, you know, if I'm writing about where I live in Tel Aviv, for example, maybe, I'm not sure it's true, but maybe I would have gotten a little bit lazy um, in English, because I'm not used to writing in English about a place like Israel, it actually forced me to, to research and to, to think about places in a new way, in a kind of unfamiliar way. Um, so it forced me a little bit to be a, um, a stranger uh, in a place that's, that's sort of familiar to me. Uh, and that, I think, uh, affected the stories. You were a hermit crab. Yeah. <laughs> I think hermit crabs are Jewish. I've always thought that. <laughs> Carrying their homes on their backs. Um, I put a post-it note next to just one of 
of uh, many passages that um, kind of uh, uh, stopped me in my tracks and I reread because it, it brought to life for me something that I know I always, uh, I often get comments, I'm sure Michael you do too, um, from students writing about literature as opposed to academic writing or history books. And often students will say, I liked reading this, this memoir or this short story because it's, it brings this home so much better than just a history book. And, uh, and of course, as a historian, I take exception to that. But, but I read this passage and I said, ha, huh, this, maybe this is what my students are saying, and this is also what makes excellent journalism as well. And I know we have at least one journalist here. We read about smuggling. We hear about the tunnels, right, from Gaza. And you didn't just you give us facts and figures and say there are these tunnels, et cetera, et cetera. And if I may be so presumptuous as to read your own writing back to you for a second, this is how Omer Friedlander describes the smuggling operations in and out of Gaza. Soldiers patrol the border, walkie-talkies crackling. Dimly lit underground tunnels snake their way between Gaza and Egypt. Tracks, carts, and pulley systems transport the goods. Canned pickles and olives, fuel and gasoline, weapons and medical supplies, jars of tomato sauce. In some larger tunnels, they smuggle cars without license plates, a mud-splattered Volkswagen, a beat-up Subaru. Once they even sneaked across animals that made their way to the Gaza Zoo, a rare white tiger and a baby elephant with, a hu with his huge wrinkled mother, her ivory tusks shining under the glow of bare light bulbs. Think about news stories that you hear about the tunnels going in and out of Gaza. I don't, I don't know about you all, but I've never read a description that brought home to me in quite the same way what goes in and out of those tunnels and just how complicated the, uh, the life is. So do you do that consciously? Uh, I, I, I do uh, research um, for the stories and it's, it, it changes. Sometimes it can be sort of reading, um, reading about it or watching a documentary, but it can also be um, talking to, to experts, um, scholars, um, which is some of the kind of most fun parts of, of, the, of writing the book because, um, for example, in a different story, uh, Jellyfish in Gaza, it's about uh, these twin brothers and uh, their dad goes to fight in, in Gaza and, um, and when he returns, they feel like he's changed um, and maybe they think that he, he's wearing a disguise, it's not really their dad. Um, and I was obviously interested in um, exploring PTSD um, with soldiers and I talked to someone who um, was a soldier but now was also working with, um, with uh, people suffering from PTSD. So those kinds of conversations were my favorite part of the research and I think I, I did it for, for probably every story um, depending on what it needed. but. Um, Sometimes it didn't make its way into the story, but it was just something um, that was very interesting. It's just a very interesting conversation. It's a background detail. Yeah, I wonder um, how much you learned about your own country, oh, yeah. right? Having to do that research because you have to translate the country, not you know, not even necessarily in, in terms of language. You have to translate the the situation there for for readers, um, especially since you're writing in English for people who, for the most part, don't live there. Um, so I have to ask you about politics. Um, a number of your stories, um, you know, pretty overtly lean to the left, and, uh, and even, not even so much a matter of left and right, but uh, you spend a lot of time conveying details of, for instance, what it's like um, the just 
the exigencies of, of living, for instance, as a Palestinian in the territories and having to go through a checkpoint and a sort of loss of dignity and things like that. You write about loss of life, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Um, are you trying to make a, a political statement? Do you hope that this will be used somehow in some context? Uh, no, I don't think so. Um, I think with writing, I mean, anyone could kind of interpret the stories, um, but I, I, I didn't write with trying to kind of convince uh, anyone. <laughs> um, it, it felt like, um, like trying to kind of um, explore these, you know, more intimate stories of certain characters, like the woman who works at the uh, checkpoint, you know, so much. Um, and when you're inhabiting a character, you, you kind of put them in the most difficult situation. And that's kind of how a story is, is created. You create the, your, that character's personal hell for them, in a way. That's where the conflict comes from. Um, so I think, you know, writing um, the story set in Israel, it's, it's sort of unavoidable. Um, and, it's, and in some stories, it's more present, in some stories, less. Um, but to me, it felt like the reality of the characters. So kind of ignoring it would feel, would feel wrong to the story, and also, also maybe uh, uh, wrong in terms of um, conveying some kind of authenticity of place. Um, I, I felt like I needed to, to address the politics. I want to open it up um, to audience questions now. Um, people, Sarah? Um, you were talking about- Actually, I'm gonna, um, here, take this. Um, I think if I get out of this chair, I'll have a good time. Hi, thank you for coming. Um, Professor Strauss had asked you uh, earlier about like the different perspectives that you wrote in the uh, in the book, and which or which character did you like most identify with, or like feel the most connection to? Uh, that's a good question. Um, I guess I, I wrote a lot about brothers and some twin brothers, so that's maybe the perspective that I felt the most um, comfortable with. Um, yeah, I guess that story, Jellyfish in Gaza, it's about twins. So maybe I'll choose that one. Is your brother a writer? <laughs> so, um, oh, Laura has an extra mic. Okay, perfect. Um, I wanted to ask the question of, kind of along the same line, uh, asking for, about perspectives. And I was wondering, what, what emotion do you tap into the most whenever writing about a perspective you may not live in and having to write out of people's shoes? Because it certainly can be a challenge for writers such as myself, but I personally tap into you know, something about like not even empathy, but and not even trying to adapt or be a chameleon, but depends on what it's about. Yeah, um, so I think to some degree maybe I've experienced um, the, the emotions of of all the characters in the stories, uh, I wasn't in any of their situations. Um, but I think some of the emotion, even if it's much less heightened, um, I think I think I have experienced. Um, so I guess finding a way to um, to make it feel uh, authentic um, to, to those characters, I guess it's it's a way of. Um, even the smallest details, you have to kind of think, what would this character see and how would they see it? Um, so when you're building a world, it's not sort of neutral. You're creating the world that this character would would see. Um, so I guess that's the way I try and think about it. Thank you. Um, I finished the book today. I loved it. It's fantastic. Um, but I want to ask you a different question because I'm struck by the marketing of the book on the back. Um, so there are eight reviews, and none of them mentions Israel. Like, but for the title, but for like the reference to the Holy Land, you wouldn't know this was a book entirely about Israel. And um, and uh, in fact, all the reviewers kind of get at something universal in your writing, which is great. And I suspect it was 
deliberate on the part of the publisher. But I was just curious what you thought about that. Like, did you did they involve you in that decision? And how did you how do you feel about like was it your idea to market it really universally, or how do you feel about that choice? Uh, yeah, no, I just write the stories for the <laughs> they, they do the rest. Um, no, I, 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 it's a good point. I, I didn't actually notice it about the, the blurbs on the back, um, and it's interesting. I guess um, when they started talking to me about the audience and and, all, and the readers and all that, I I knew that it would make sense that um, for Jewish readers it would be more of an easier kind of step to, to read it than maybe someone who's not familiar with it. Um, but I did want it to feel... Uh, I don't know. I, I guess I guess universal in a way that it would it would be something that anyone could um, could read, and I guess that's also the um, this thing we, we were talking about translations uh, dinner, and um, it's being translated into a couple of languages, but not Hebrew. Um, and I feel like <laughs> which is funny, I guess. Um, but if it is, if it will be, uh, I wouldn't do it myself, but I would kind of work maybe with the translator because. There are all these kinds of moments and um, sentences that put things into context for a reader that might not be familiar, but for an Israeli reader, um, it might feel a little kind of, you know, not necessary. Um, yeah. Good notes. <laughs> yeah. It was a great talk. Do you ever have characters who are compelling enough to you and stay with you enough that you think they'll come back in future stories? Mm -hmm. Uh, that's a good question. Um, not yet, um, maybe. So I, I'm working on a longer, I'm working on a novel, um, but at least for now, it's all new characters. So we'll see. <laughs> you mentioned about trans that you might have your book translated in Hebrew. And you also mentioned that one of your favorite uh, writers is Jumpa Nahiri. Who has written lately in Italian and has translated her book into English? Have you thought about bringing it yourself sure. into Hebrew? Like Jumpa Lahiri? So, just the question because I think the mic wasn't on is, um, is has he thought about translating the books himself uh, using the model of Jumpa Lahiri? Like Jumpa Lahiri has translated it from Italian, even though Italian is not her native language, into English, which is her native language. Have you thought about doing it? something like her, translating it into Hebrew, which is your native language. Yeah, um, I don't think I would I would translate it on my own. Uh, I would uh, give it to a translator and, and maybe work with them. Uh, but it feels like translation is its own art form, uh, which is different to, to writing, creative writing. Um, so, so I don't think I would do a good job, but I would maybe, you know, be like a consultant on it or something. I guess I was just really struck by um, the one story you brought up in the beginning about uh, your friend that was jealous of you for having a survivor as a grandparent. Um, and I'm just curious how that conversation went. And <laughs> like, because I'm Ashkenazi, I'm a third generation, my PA survivor. Um, so I guess I'm just curious, like, I don't necessarily think I'd be offended by that, but it's definitely a weird, like, both of us were like, Oh my God! So, like, what did that look like? I guess. Yeah, I think it um, it didn't offend me. It was just kind of a an interesting, you know, uh, thought. And I and I I think it's also maybe a way of exploring some of the tensions uh, in Israel between Ashkenazim and um, Mizrahim um, through this kind of unusual uh, lens of Holocaust. But. Um, yeah, I mean, the conversation wasn't so sophisticated. It was kind of like, well, you know, he just kind of just like, um, yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, sorry, Omer, so I also finished your book today, and I loved it. And, you know, it, it gave me so much pause. Like, I, I couldn't read it at once because I need to, to reflect. Um, I wonder. I wanted to ask you. It seems deliberate, but I don't know if you thought about it. 
uh, you present Israel, um, and it's very different from the type of books, Israeli books that we read, because they are they are encapsulated in one time. It's a, it's a novel from now, it's a novel from before, but you you take us on a, on a trip throughout the history, uh, before the the state and all throughout. But also, I think deliberately you present us very different characters, the Bedouin, the mother at the checkpoint, the orange grove, uh, uh, you know, the, the, the people, or, or the walking Shiva, the people that are, are those all fictions, or you were trying to, to put in this book all of Israel together, the different times, the different characters? Yeah, I think um, I, I did, uh, once I started thinking of it as a collection of stories, I. I, I did want to kind of uh, create all these different voices, uh, points of view, and in, in, in time periods. I think it felt organic. I was just writing these stories, um, but um, but yeah, I, I think uh, even thinking about the order of the stories uh, and and what sometimes readers skip around, and I do that too. But um, in terms of the order, it also has a kind of logic of. Um, the, the two stories that frame, you know, the beginning and the end, those two stories kind of have this big historical jump uh, in time. Um, from pre-state, like you said, to 2000 in the first story, and the second story, uh, the Ma'bala, so the 50s, jumping to 2013. Um, so I, I, I thought about it, a kind of, almost like, um, like making a music album, kind of having a little bit of a journey. Are they all fiction? You think so, the, the, Yeah, they are fiction. Um, what kind of, you know, moments and things are inspired by things I've heard or read, or um, but they've kind of been transformed. <laughs> By your last point, can you just give us an example of, of what was inspired from real life? We've all read your book and love it, so curious. And then this my actual question, uh, and I, we've got a book group here <laughs> of fans. Um, but my actual question also was, you mentioned that you're working on a novel, and I'd love to hear how that's going for you, if it's your first novel, what the challenges are, how you're trying to kind of overcome whatever those challenges are. And if any of the short stories, some of them felt to me like, Maybe these were beginnings of a novel that you decided not to write. Yeah, so with a novel, it's a easy answer uh, because I don't I don't like talking about it so much, um, <laughs> and um, it's uh, I like this thing that Amos Oz always said when he was asked about uh, what he was working on. He he said uh, the X rays harm the baby, so I'm trying to uh, keep it a secret, um, and with stories. Um, there are some, like for example, um, Walking Shiva. I was interested in this idea of, um, of grieving for someone, but not knowing exactly if they're dead or not. Um, so it was kind of a little bit inspired by a family story. Um, so this is um, on my mom's side, my great-great-great-grandparent or something. Uh, came from uh, Belarus to Canada, and um, he went there to work in you know the fur business or something. Uh, and his family, his wife and kids, were supposed to join uh, a bit later. So he went first, and then they were supposed to join join him in Canada. And they had a ship that they were supposed to board, and um, they were a big family. Um, one of the daughters was a violinist, and they all went to board the ship, and she forgot her violin. So they didn't board the ship, they went back for the, for the violin, and they said, okay, we'll board the next ship. And the ship sunk, and everyone uh, was killed, and um, drowned. So uh, the father of the family, who had already gone to, Bel to Canada, uh, thought they, they had all died. There was no way of communicating. Um, immediately, and so he sat Shiva for, for the whole family, and then, you know, they arrived on the next boat a week later, or whatever it was, um, 
so it's a kind of family legend, and um, I was interested in this idea of grieving for someone but not exactly knowing uh, their fate. So that's where that story came from. Take one more question, if there is. Oh, Michael has a question. Here. Yeah, thank you, uh, Omer. I, I want to um, continue the line that uh, Lauren asked you about representation. Mm -hmm. I was thinking a lot about it, uh, reading and now listening to this story uh, you read parts of today. And I wonder if there are, in your mind, everybody thinks differently, but there's maybe certain topics where it is very hard or inappropriate for others. Let's say for a, I don't know, for a non-third generation, for a non-Jewish American, for a German writer. Can a German writer, for example, write a story like that? And how would you look at it? Yeah, no, I, I think there are there are definitely limits, and it should be a conversation, and it's it it shouldn't be a kind of everything is allowed. Um, I think I think it should always be considered. I sort of with these stories, I wouldn't um, at least I tried to 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 research and to kind of uh, do it in a way that I felt was um, was was doing the work that I could and kind of taking you know an imaginative leap. Um, so I think you, I did need to remain kind of a uh, little playful with it and give myself some room to, uh, to make things up, to imagine something else, but, um, I wouldn't try it with every story. Um, so I think with these stories, I, I really thought about what I, I can kind of pull off maybe with the writing. And I think a lot of it has to do with, with the writing itself, how you do it. Um, and not only the kind of what you do. So it's a kind of mix of both. I have one final question. Um, I thought of uh, a very famous book that I'm sorry, I only know the English title. Uh, when Marina asked you a question about, um, you know, your stories having a representation of a little bit of Israel in each of them and sort of, you know, moving uh, along a historical timeline, it reminded me of it's almost like a fiction version of Amos book uh, in the Land of Israel. Mm. It's famous, I think, it's 1982, um, and that was um, that was one of the first real attempts from the Israeli Jewish point of view to show um, vignettes of, in that case, reportage and real, you know, real portraits of Israeli Arabs, Israeli Jews, Palestinians. So this is a big question. Some, some of us in this room have been involved in uh, what's called shared society, organizations and shared society efforts. And those focus on person-to-person -person interactions, whether through sports, literature, whatever. So I, I was thinking while I was reading your book that, that it is, even though it's fiction, it's sort of a, an example of that you get to know people and their humanity. So what, as a writer, as an Israeli, as at the moment sort of an expat, um, a citizen of the world, your book being marketed universally, what gives you hope? And what can you do about it as a writer? Uh, hmm. I'm not sure. Um, it, 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 it's, it's a little difficult to be hopeful. Um, but I think, at least with... With the writing, um, with writing this this novel, this new project that I'm working on, it did make me think, uh, kind of, um, with 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 some of the more recent political uh, developments. Uh, what do I write, and what's the perspective, and can I write something historical, or um, or does it have to be present, to kind of contemporary, in order to address some of these things? Um, I think, I guess, maybe there is hope in um, it, kind of reaching um, across certain boundaries with the readers. Um, if it is translated, um, at the moment it's, you know, Turkish, Italian, Dutch. Um, but maybe, maybe there is hope with the kind of dialogue through 
uh, translation and, and um, things like that. Maybe that's a small thing, but that's kind of um, the biggest thing I can no, <laughs> think big, of at the it's moment. It's a big thing. That is big enough. Thank you so, so, so much. Um, Thank you all for your great questions, and thank you to Michael and Laura and the Center for Israel Studies.